Okay, open up your Bibles to the Gospel according to John, chapter 12, as we continue our study through the Bible, book by book, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. If you need a Bible, there should be Bibles in front of you under those chair racks. If you're using a digital Bible, I'm using the New American Standard Version, probably easiest to follow along. The Church Bible is page 1075. You'll jump right to it. So John chapter 12, verse 12. We're going to pick up where we left off, jump right into it. On the next day, the large crowd who had come to the feast when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem took the branches of palm trees and went out to meet him and began to shout, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. So the people who were with him when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify about him. For this reason also the people went and met him because they heard that he had performed this sign. So the Pharisees said to one another, you see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. Lord Jesus, as we come before your word today, would you speak to us? Lord, your word is amazing. It's alive, it's active. Lord, thank you for the testimony of your word. Jesus, that these things were written down that we may believe. God, would you give us insight to your character, to your nature? Would you speak to us, Lord, individually, Lord, specifically? Would you speak to us corporately as a church body? Lord, we do want to lift up all of the relief work that's going out, Lord, and how amazing it is that the, the churches rally together, your people rally together to bless and to serve others. Lord, would you bless the efforts, the supplies being gathered, all of the work being done. Lord, and we do continue to pray for our nation. God, we pray for this upcoming election that your will would be done. And God, that you'd move through your people. And Lord, we continue to pray for Israel. Lord, that there would be peace in Jerusalem. Bless us now, Lord. Speak to us, Lord. Reveal your will to us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus enters Jerusalem seated on a donkey's colt. The King of Kings, the Lord of Lords riding into the capital city on a small donkey. You know, John tells us here that this was a fulfillment of Scripture. Specifically, you know, of the Messiah to come. This was 500 years prior to Jesus showing up on the scene here. 500 years prior to this, Zechariah says, this is Zechariah 9.9, I have this for the screen, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the full of a donkey. And so he says, Rejoice. Fear not, your king is here. I love this passage in 1 John 4 when it talks about that, that you know, Perfect love casts out fear. And when we consider the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, it's all about God's love. And Jesus is a fulfillment of God's love. We have that passage we read in John 3. God so loved the world that he sent his own son. And so we see that Jesus is this fulfillment of God's love. And this, this entrance that Jesus makes here this is a very humble entrance. My daughter, she's, uh, I asked for permission, by the way. Uh, she's into these four-legged creatures they call horses. She's got a couple of them, actually. We have the first picture. So we've got one here. This is, this is Gizmo. He's a miniature horse, not a pony. It's a miniature horse. And then we got another one here. What's the second one? This is Sophie. She's a Missouri foxtrotter. She's 
hot-blooded red mare. What's interesting is, you can go to that next slide, is the donkey's colt is about the size of that miniature horse. And in ancient Israel, it was significant if the king was riding in on a horse or riding in on a donkey. The donkey was normal travel. King riding in on a donkey meant business as usual. I bring peace. Now, if the king rode in on a horse, that means he was bringing a sword and he was bringing war. Which one? I mean, which one's more powerful here, do you think? Okay, you can get rid of those pictures. That's fun. Just want to again give you a visual of the humbleness of a donkey's colt compared to, say, a full-size horse. So Jesus rode in on a donkey, and it, they proclaim him to be king. It says here, the king of Israel, he's coming. Behold, your king is coming. Jesus was more than king. He was also the Lamb of God. He rode into Jerusalem in humility, lowly. He came in peace. He came to bring peace in a way that no one expected the Messiah to come. We have this passage in Colossians. This is Colossians chapter 1, verse 19. It says, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, having made peace through the blood of his cross. Through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. This is the gospel. That we can have peace with God, we can have eternal life through the blood that Jesus shed on the cross. And he initiated this time through his death, the burial, and resurrection. He initiated a time of peace. And, and this is the time that we're living in, the time of peace. And we know from Scripture that Jesus is going to come again. And when Jesus comes back, what is he going to be riding? A horse. This is Revelation 19, verse 11. Revelation 19, 11 says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. And so at his first coming, Jesus comes in humility. He comes in peace. And he comes to create peace between man and his creator. But at his second coming, he brings the sword of judgment. And so this scene here is a scene of peace. Now, you also may know this. We call this Palm Sunday. This is the Sunday before what we celebrate on Easter, the Resurrection Day. And we saw in our last time together that this event here kicks off the final week of Jesus' life. And we often call that the Passion Week. And so for the rest of our study in the gospel according to John, we'll be dealing with this Passion Week, this final week of Jesus' life and his earthly ministry. And one of the things that we observe is that Jesus is very intentional. He, He doesn't just say things off the cuff or do things randomly. What he says and what he does is very intentional and is a fulfillment of prophecy after prophecy, fulfillment of God's word. And so we see that this entry into Jerusalem in this way at this time was the fulfilled prophecy. Again, it's pointing people to the fact that he truly is the Messiah. Now, not all understood this. Did you catch that in verse 16? These things his disciples did not understand at the first. But later, he says, when when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. I don't know about you, but I can identify with that. I mean, this is so often how I understand how the Lord works. It's later, you know? Stuff happens in my life, and I, and I don't fully understand, you know, why things are unfolding the way things are unfolding. And then later, after the unfolding of the events, I see, oh, Lord, that's what you were doing. I remember when uh, Pastor Kelly was going to retire, and 
before I came on as the lead pastor, he was talking about his retirement, and the guy I thought was going to take over for him had left and planted another church in Arlington. And I remember telling my wife, that's weird. I wonder, I wonder who's going to take over for Kelly? Who's going to be the guy? And then I was asked, and I was like, oh, <laughs> I see what the Lord has been doing for the last 15 years of my life <laughs> leading to this moment, but I didn't get it. Are you like me? Thankfully, these things were recorded. Jesus knew that people would be thinking about this moment, studying this moment, considering this moment. And so these things are written. John's going to talk about it later, actually, at the end of the book, about these things were written down so that we may believe. Verse 20, he says, Now there were some Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. These then came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, saying, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Jesus' impact is beginning to stir the world to belief in him. You saw that at the end of verse 19. Look, the world has gone after him. Now, we're not told the background of these certain Greeks. They may have been Greek converts to Judaism. Uh, They may have been Greek God-fearers, those who had great respect for Judaism but maybe didn't convert. They may have simply just been Greek travelers known for their, you know, curiosity. But it seems as though they're converts to Judaism because they're coming to worship at the feast. And remember the feast that we're talking about here. John set us up in John 11 and told us that the Passover was coming. We read in John 11, verse 55, the Passover of the Jews was near, and many went up to Jerusalem out of the country before the Passover to purify themselves. And then we saw in John chapter 12, verse 1, there was six, therefore Jesus, uh, six days before the Passover, he came to Bethany. This is the area of uh, Jerusalem. And so Passover is one of these pilgrimage festivals that the Jews all over would make their way to Jerusalem to gather, to celebrate this feast. And this was instituted back in the book of Exodus at the point where God had delivered the Israelites from Exodus there. Remember the the plagues that came against Pharaoh and the Egyptians? And um, I said Exodus, I meant Egypt. Sorry, you knew what I meant. And it says that they were given this instruction about putting the blood on the doorposts of their house and so that when God's wrath came, it would pass over them. This is from Exodus chapter 12. I have this for the screen. This is Exodus 12, 23. It says, For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your house to smite you. And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. And so you had that scene there in Egypt. The Israelites wanted to get out. God wanted them to get out so they could worship him freely. Egypt did not want to let them get out. Pharaoh said, no, you can't leave. And so God sends the plagues. And that last and final plague was this angel of death that was going to come in and administer God's wrath. And so by putting this the blood of the perfect spotless lamb on the doorposts of their house, God's wrath passed over them. And so then they were told to then celebrate this as an annual memorial. And so here it is in John 12, 1,500 years after that event, that they, Jesus, and a bunch of folks are celebrating the Passover feast. And 2,000 years after this event, today in our day, Jews are still celebrating the Passover. All that to say, these Greeks had interests in the things concerning the Lord. I love that line at the end of verse 21. Sir, we wish to see Jesus. So Philip came, verse 22, and told Andrew. Andrew and Philip came and told Jesus, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it 
to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So Jesus says, this is it. The hour has come for him to be glorified. When Jesus is talking about him being glorified, he's talking about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. When he talks about being lifted up, he's talking about being put on the cross. He says, verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. You understand this. The seed of a plant has to be buried in order to come to life. And the, the life that springs up from the dead seed doesn't look like the plant. Jason, show that one picture of the seed here. Okay, guess the seed. Tis the season. It's a pumpkin, right? What's the next slide? Okay, go back to the seed. Does that look like the next one? That? You get it, right? So Jesus is talking about his burial and the life that will spring up from that burial. You know, Paul talks about this in context to this future resurrection of the believer. I want you to see this. Turn with me over to 1 Corinthians. So go to the right in your New Testament there. If you've got our church Bible, that's page 1,153. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. Just kind of give this concept a little bit more texture. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 35, we'll kind of skip down to this, the meat of it. This is an instruction in context of the resurrection of the believer, but it's in the same vein of what Jesus is talking about in John 12. In verse 35, someone will say, how are the dead raised? And with what kind of body do they come? You fool, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And that which you sow, you do not sow the body which it is to be, but of bare grain, perhaps of wheat or of something else. Okay, the pumpkin seed turning into the pumpkin. But God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own. All flesh is not the same flesh, but there's one flesh of men and another flesh of beasts and another flesh of birds and another of fish. There are also heavenly bodies and earthly bodies. But the glory of the heavenly is one and the glory of the earthly is another. There is one glory of the sun and another glory of the moon and another glory of the stars for star differs from star in glory. Verse 42, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown a perishable body, but it is raised an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor and is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness and is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there also is a spiritual body. So also it is written, the first man, Adam, became a life-giving soul. The last Adam became a life-giving soul spirit. He's talking about Adam and Jesus. The first Adam gave us our earthly form. The last Adam, Jesus, gives us our heavenly form by where by his spirit is from heaven, by where we can be in heaven with him. We can't go to heaven in these bodies. They don't work in heaven. They can't breathe that air. And so by what Jesus did through his death and burial and resurrection, he makes it possible that we can be risen with new bodies by his spirit. Go back to our text in John 12. So Jesus is talking this kind of this, it's a layered Instruction. He's talking about his own death and burial and resurrection. But then he's also talking about the Christian life and how there needs to be a, a burial of the flesh so that the spirit can be raised. 
A life in the Spirit can be raised. He says in verse 25, he who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. In the Gospel according to Mark, there's this same passage said a little bit differently. This is, I have this for the screen. This is Mark 8, verse 35. Jesus says, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Jesus says, if you wish to serve him, you must follow him. He's laying aside his fleshly desires for the sake of another. And so he points us to this idea of the Christian life as one who buries that, lets that fleshly tendencies be buried so that the life in the spirit can be raised. And in this context of laying aside his own desires for the sake of another, look what he says in verse 27. He says, so I'm in John 12, 27. Now my soul has become troubled And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. And so he knew what he was about to partake in, to lose his life. This is similar language that's recorded for us when Jesus prayed in the garden when he was betrayed and when he was arrested, it said that he prayed in agony. This is in Matthew 26, 38. I have this for the screen. He said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and he fell on his face and he prayed saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And so Jesus tells us Verse 26, if anyone serves me, he must follow me. Where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. And so he recognized this is a, this is a, a difficult statement that he makes. But this is where true life comes by laying down our own lives. And for Jesus, this was his mission. He says, What shall I say? Verse 27, Father, save me from this hour, but it is for this purpose that I came, to this hour. This was his mission. This was his purpose. He was on a rescue mission. And so when he says, not my will, but your will be done, he's submitting to his father. And so he was a person that was in authority and a person that was under authority. And and this is the Christian life. God gives us authority, but we're ultimately under his authority. He says in verse 28, Father, glorify your name. And then a voice came out of heaven. I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. So the crowd of people who stood by and heard it were saying that it had thundered. Others were saying an angel has spoken to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice has not come for my sake, but for your sake. Now judgment is upon this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. But he was saying this to indicate the kind of death that he was to die. So again, when he says that he, if he is lifted up, he's talking about the crucifixion, to be lifted up on the cross, to lay down his life by his death, to be buried, then to be lifted up in resurrection, conquering death. This voice that came out of heaven, this is the third time that a voice of the Father speaks from heaven. The first time was at his baptism. We read that at the beginning of his ministry. The second time was on the Mount of Transfiguration in the middle of his ministry. Now here's the third time at the end of his ministry, talking about the cross. And all three of those occasions ultimately speak of his death. 
In baptism, Jesus was in effect saying, I submit to the death and the burial I know awaits me. At the transfiguration, Luke records for us they were talking about his departure. And here, Jesus is troubled by the cross. It's an interesting observation. You, know, you might say, I never hear from God. He never speaks to me. Here's the question. Where do you stand in relation to the cross? Are you dying to self? Or are you living for self? Jesus says if you die to self, then the Father is going to honor that. The one who dies to self is going to hear the heart and the voice of the Father. And Jesus here, he tells the crowd, this voice wasn't for me, but it was, it was for you. And that through this testimony and through the sacrifice, judgment has come. He says in verse 31, now judgment is upon the world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And so Jesus is going to conquer sin and death through his burial and resurrection. And the power of sin is going to become powerless. Verse 34, the crowd then answered. They answered him, we have heard about a law, the law that Christ is to remain forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? So there was a misinterpretation of the Old Testament prophecy of the Messiah to come. There was an assumption that there was just this one coming. But when you look closely, there is two comings. His first coming, the sacrificial lamb. The second coming, the conquering king. And he would be to remain forever at that one. And so Jesus said to them, verse 35, For a little while longer the light is among you, Walk while you have the light, so the darkness not, will not overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of the light. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away, and he hid himself from them. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. This has been a, a topic of conversation quite a bit the last you know, several weeks as we have gone through the gospel according to John here. You know, up to this point, Jesus, we've seen Jesus do miraculous things. God speaking audibly from heaven about who he is, giving testimony who he is, the blind seeing, the deaf hearing, the dead rising, and yet there is unbelief. What else do they need for them to believe? Remember that passage that when Jesus was engaged with Thomas and he told Thomas to come and touch and see and, and feel. And then he, he tells Thomas, he says, don't be unbelieving, but believe. John tells us here that this unbelief actually is a fulfillment of prophecy. He says in verse 38, this was to fulfill the word of Isaiah, the prophet, which he spoke, Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For this reason, they could not believe, for Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes, and he has hardened their heart, so that they would not see with their eyes, and perceive with their heart, and be converted, and I heal them. These things Isaiah said, because he saw his glory, and he spoke of him. Nevertheless, many, even the rulers, believed in him, but... Because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue. Verse 43, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. Wow. Jesus, the Messiah, right before their eyes, doing the miraculous, moving in and amongst them. 
yet because of, they desired the approval of man more than the approval of God, they become blind and deaf to the things of God. Ultimately, their hearts were hardened to the things of God. You know, at some point, if you continue in your unbelief, your heart will become hardened to the things of the Lord. If you continue in unbelief, your eyes will grow dim to seeing the things of the Lord. Your ears will become deaf to hearing things in the words of God. It's like saying, I won't, so therefore... I can't. You ever had that experience? You ever talk to a young person about doing something like, I can't do that? Well, you don't know if you don't try. And so it's almost like this predetermined, I won't, so therefore I can't. And God recognizing that, they become then a fulfillment of this prophecy of being blind to the things of the Lord and their hearts being hardened to the things of the Lord. So they would not perceive or see and be converted and be healed, it says in verse 39, 40, verse 40. Verse 44, and Jesus cried out and said, he who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. He who sees me Sees the one who sent me. I have come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me, verse 48, and does not receive my sayings, has one who judges him. The words I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. That's why the words of Jesus carry so much weight and why we should pay so close attention to the words of Jesus. They're the very words of God. They're the words that lead to eternal life. And to believe in Jesus as the Messiah, to believe in Jesus as the Son of God, to believe in Jesus and who he said he is, means that your name is written in his book. See, at the last day, he he says here this interesting statement, Verse 48, he who rejects me does not receive my sayings, has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. See, at the last day, there's going to be books that are open. We read about this in the book of Revelation. Revelation tells us that at the great white throne judgment, all will come before God's throne. And these books are going to be opened, and there's going to be a written account of whose names are in the book and not in the book. This becomes the judgment of the last day. This is Revelation 20. I have this for the screen. Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, And another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them, and they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. And then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. And then right after that, is the creation of the new heavens and the new earth. And those names who are in the book are in the new heavens and the new earth for eternity. And so by faith in Jesus, belief in Jesus as the Messiah, as the Son of God, your name is written in his book. If you reject his sayings, as he's saying here, this is the judgment that is going to come at the last day. 
But the promise is in the scriptures, if we confess with our mouth Jesus as Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that you shall be saved. In Ephesians, it tells us that we are sealed with the, the Holy Spirit of promise for the day of redemption so that God knows whose his are. And so by faith in Jesus, belief in him, your name is written in his book and you have eternal life. This is the promise of faith through faith in Jesus. I want to end with just one final thought here. I love the attitude that we see in verse 21. And just that line at the end of verse 21, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Let that be our attitude. No matter what is going on in this life, no matter what is going on in in your life, in this world, past, present, future, we wish to see Jesus. For his words lead to eternal life. And we want to follow Jesus. We wish to see Jesus. Lord, that's our prayer this morning. We wish to see you. God, would you reveal yourself to us in your word, in our times of prayer, in our times of gathering. Thank you for the confidence that we can have, the promises of your word. By faith in you, we have eternal life. That our sins are forgiven. We have the hope of heaven. God, would you fill us with your spirit. Give us wisdom. Discernment in these days, Lord. We need wisdom and discernment in these days. Help us to know the truth, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.